into chapter 14, which is all about RNA and protein synthesis. And as we mentioned in class, RNA is the master and commander of protein synthesis. So once we get a feel for what overall we're doing, we're going to start with a focus on how RNA helps us do it. We know from our previous chapters on genetics and DNA replication and on the cell that DNA makes us who we are. We know that whether you have green eyes or blue eyes or brown eyes is inherited in your genes. We know that attached earlobes or a widow's peak or colorblindness or hemophilia, those are things that are inherited in our genes. What we haven't pieced together yet is how the DNA ultimately drives those traits, creates those traits within our human body. So DNA makes proteins and proteins run the show. So in this picture here, each of these gray circles is definitely a protein and probably some of the yellow, green, purple, and blue shapes are also proteins. Proteins modify other proteins. Uh, if you want to flex your muscle, you need proteins to do that because your muscle is made of protein. If you want to send a signal to one part of your body or to another part of your body, you send it with proteins and proteins respond. If you want to fight a virus, a viral infection, a protein does that for you. Proteins do almost everything that is in our body and the DNA tells them which proteins to make where to make it, how to make it. And so the DNA controls the proteins, the proteins control your body. So in this chapter, we're really looking at how. How does the DNA make those proteins and how do we get the correct proteins in the right places inside of our body? So we're gonna be looking at kind of two things. One is how we make the proteins and then also how we control or regulate those genes in the making of those proteins. We are start with a really simplified explanation of what's happening. And I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but sometimes when someone tells you a story and they're like, oh, I was over at my aunt's house. Well, actually it's not my aunt. It's my sister's husband's mother's sister-in-law. And you're like, whoa, who? Okay, if I take my way back through, I can like take it one chunk at a time. Uh, and then I can understand what you're saying. And protein synthesis is kind of like that. It's not that protein synthesis is so complicated. It's that most of the words we use in protein synthesis are brand new. So we have to really concentrate and get a true deep understanding of each of the terms before we can understand how protein synthesis totally works. So I'm gonna start with just this sort of overview of what happens during protein synthesis. So we're gonna start up here and we're looking at the hemoglobin gene. So this is the gene for hemoglobin, which is a protein in your blood that attaches to oxygen and carries oxygen throughout your blood. So this section of DNA right here is that gene. And so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna transcribe the gene. The DNA is too important to get to leave the nucleus. It's dangerous outside of the nucleus. So we need to keep that DNA safe and secure and sequestered inside of the nucleus. And so we only let out a Xerox copy or a rubbing, like an imprint of the hemoglobin gene. We can't let out the real gene because if that got damaged, you couldn't transport oxygen anymore and you would die. So we need to make sure that it's not the gene itself it's just a replica or a complement of the gene. So we make a complement of the gene into mRNA. mRNA is the messenger RNA. So my mRNA is up here, the messenger has been made. And now this messenger is gonna go out of the nucleus, out to where it's dangerous, but that's okay because it's just a copy. We have the original safe and secure and sequestered inside of our nucleus. We can take the copy out. So we take the copy out of the nucleus and the mRNA goes to the ribosome. The ribosome is the site of protein synthesis. Remember the ribosomes make the rough ER look rough. 
The ribosomes are also free floating in the cytoplasm and the messenger RNA goes to the ribosomal or the R RNA that's a place. And while it's there, the T RNA, the transfer RNAs translate the code, the genetic code, GUU or CAA, they translate that into little amino acids. And each of these amino acids then becomes the hemoglobin protein. And this protein then goes into your cell and transports blood and either does or does not have sickle cell disease. So the code of your DNA changes the structure of the protein and then that determines whether or not you have sickle cell disease or whether your blood is able to transport oxygen without trouble. This is the big picture of protein synthesis and we'll come back to this big picture over and over again. In the meantime, we're gonna get a whole bunch of details about how is it transcribed and what happens to the transcription before it goes to the ribosome and then how does the ribosome turn it into a protein and how does it match and what is the code we're going to answer all of those specific questions throughout the chapter but for now uh, we're going to start by really taking a deeper dive look at these different rnas that exist within the process of protein synthesis so rna is the star of protein synthesis rna does it all and there's a hypothesis called rna world that talks about that rnas used to be in charge of everything before dna was on the block rnas ran the whole show um, and protein synthesis is evidence for that because during protein synthesis all DNA does is hold the original copy. RNA does all of the other work of making those proteins to make you who you are. So first we have messenger RNA or mRNA. It says two types of RNA here and it should say three. So we use three types of RNA. mRNA makes the copy from our DNA and so it's making a visual copy. Um, this would be like if you had a really, um, if I had a recipe at my house and you were, you came over for dinner and you ate this food and you were like, oh my gosh, that's so good. Can I get the recipe? Well, I'm not going to give you my original recipe because then I won't have one. Right. And so what I'm going to give you is I'm going to quickly write down the recipe and then hand it to you. Okay. In that case, the little recipe card, that is the messenger RNA. It is a copy of the stored information. It's a copy of my recipe that I have. Then you're going to take that recipe home to your kitchen. Your kitchen is the RRNA. It's the pots and the pans, the stove, the oven, the countertop, all of the things that you use to make that recipe. And the tRNA then, I suppose, are the ingredients. This is where the example kind of falls apart. The tRNA changes the written recipe into the food itself. And so maybe that's me reading the word apple and then grabbing an apple, that would make me the transfer RNA. Or if I see three cups of sugar and so I measure and get three cups of sugar, that's me being the tRNA. I'm transferring from the writing on the recipe into action into the product of the food that we're making. The ribosomal rRNA is the place and also the energy, it's a catalyst. The tRNA holds the connection between the genetic code and the amino acid. And the messenger RNA brings the original recipe so that we know which amino acid to add next. So of course we need all three not two, like it says, all three types of RNA in order to successfully make a protein. Down here, we have pictures of them. The messenger RNA, again, holds the code. The ribosomal RNA is this blobby location. And then the tRNA has an anticodon, so a match to the mRNA. And it also has a corresponding amino acid that it's going to connect as part of the protein. In each stage of protein synthesis, there is a chance for regulation. 
in transcription, we have our DNA open up and we make this piece of mRNA that comes in and gets aligned. But we have regulators at this point. Just because you have a gene doesn't mean you would transcribe it. The packing of the gene, how tightly coiled the DNA is or whether or not it's loosely opened, whether or not transcription factors are around, all control how much of that gene product is made. Before we take the mRNA out of the nucleus, we need to protect it and splice it. And we can control the expression of the gene here at the splicing and processing by doing alternative splicing. And then once the gene is out here being translated, we can determine how many proteins get made from that one piece of mRNA. Is it many, many, many proteins that are being made or just a few proteins that are being made or just one protein that gets made from that mRNA copy? And that also controls or regulates the gene expression. So as we go through each stage, transcription, splicing, translation, we will also be discussing the regulators, the on and off, the volume control more accurately of how much of this gene is being transcribed within the cell. This is how we are certain that your skin is skin and your skin sweats and makes oil, but your stomach doesn't sweat. Okay, we don't want sweat glands in our stomach. Uh, we want our stomach to produce hydrochloric acid. We don't want hydrochloric acid oozing out on our skin. That would burn our skin. So we need to make sure that genes are expressed exactly where they're supposed to be and nowhere else. And so as we learn about protein synthesis, we will also be learning about the regulation of protein synthesis. How do we express only the genes we need to all of the genes we need to and in exactly the right amounts. All right, guys, details on this will follow. Have a great day.